Vander. As you make your bedroll for the night, everybody in your troop is well uh, stocked. You noticed when you took out the canned dog food for Bandit, eyes in the room kind of all hovering in your direction. And there's also a door that's remained closed, but you can tell by a shadow that shifts underneath. Somebody's been there this whole time. Somebody you didn't originally see. Right. Um, yeah, sorry, guys. I, uh, I should have thought about this. You all look like you may not have had the, the best stock of food here around uh, since you've been down here. I actually... I can help with that a little bit. Um, uh, how many how many people? So you'll see a total of eight people, including Dr. Glass, including everybody else. In, that is Dr. Glass, Nihilus Von Stone, and Trevor. You see Lord Felix Royce, Mr. Augie, who is this like accountant-style personality. No reason for being here. I'm quite nervous. You see Father Patrick, who is a, a well-accomplished priest, it looks like. Ken, a burly dock worker, uh, Dr. Hypatia Singer, and that's it. And so, again, uh, I, I, myself, and by the way, uh, my name is uh, Vander, and as I'm saying this, I'm, I'm taking off the rebreather, uh, settling in. You can see now Vander underneath all this uh, clothing that he is wearing. A human man, probably in his early to mid 40s gaunt uh short salt and pepper uh hair uh, maybe a, a week or two of a uh, uh, facial hair um again uh, thank you for taking us in uh, the least i can do is repay you in kind um abby uh can you hand me my, my pouch there yes <laughs> You see as she was fidgeting with this like little pu- wooden puzzle toy that she always keeps with her and pushes it to the side and pushes it over to you. Uh, Vander takes a pouch uh, and reaches inside and pulls out uh, a small sprig of uh, looks like mistletoe uh, and a vial of probably water. It settles down and begins a, a, a very common water stalker ritual. And uh, essentially what I'm doing is I am casting the Goodberry spell. Uh, and I will create ten good berries to be passed around as he fit. What are these good berries like in this world when you conjure them? You know the lemon bread from Lord of the Rings? It's, it has no flavor to it. It's not a very flavorful uh, meal, mm-hmm. but it does sustain uh, your hunger and uh, satiate you, at least for a day. So uh, they, I imagine they're still berry, berry-like uh, that grows off the twig. And uh, I will uh, pass them around to anyone who seems like they need it. This one can create food. This one can create water. That's actually great, Lord Felix Roy says genuinely. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> That's incredible. And Dr. Glass very specifically glares at Felix as she takes a good berry. So, um, again, thank you for, for letting us crash here for the evening. I gotta ask, though, you, you, you lot are you're out in the middle of nowhere in these godforsaken lands. What are you doing here? Well, <laughs> we're not quite sure. We were originally trapped here, captured, unaware of how we were even brought here. Well, as you can see from the surface, and, well, we don't have any rebreathers. We have no way of traveling here. We, we've been stuck here for weeks, rationing. You're, you're honestly the first glimpse of hope we've had in too long of a time. Please, you're, you're so welcome. Yeah. We could really use the help. This building that you saw along the way in the distance was warehouse-like. It was a large metal structure, and any building that is sealed is a very likely place that a water stalker would use to stop to rest and likely supplies could be left it's it's quite common there is a level of professional courtesy within this profession 
That said, this building is not on your map. It's not one that you've been to. Even going to a sealed building that's not, at least among your tribe of water stalkers, a known entity could be dangerous if it's not a water stalker building. And you would know it might be dangerous to go alone too. And that- do Augie or Felix or Hypatia know of anyone who would come get them if we were able to contact them, like some sort of search and rescue service, or does Felix have some sort of ally? Like, is is it possible that there's a question of like Vander getting one of us to some place where we could send a message? You, I mean, everybody knows somebody, and Hypatia Singer and Augie could, you know, you could tell a friend, a family member, a co- collaborator, a faculty, but after speaking to them, you'd know there is no rescue service in the salt wastes. The salt wastes are are avoided by everyone who isn't professionally trained to go here. So yeah, as I was saying, uh, there's a building I passed on the way out here. It, I'm not making any guarantees. It, there might be some supplies there. Maybe not. I'm I'm not familiar with it. It's hard for me to get you all out there without any sort of protection from salt. Do you have any sort of rebreezes here or, or any kind of makeshift protection? None at all. We have well, whatever we're wearing, really. Yeah, yeah. Before you showed up, I was about ready to head out there and nothing but a shirt around my mouth. But we ain't got no rebreathers. What about uh, hands or or excess cloth? Maybe some charcoal? Any of that lying around? Of some extra? I'm sure we could fashion something for a couple of people at least. Yes, we certainly have cans. Charcoal you could make. I do, I do have some charcoal. Well, <sighs> the storm is actively blowing, right? Like salt is blowing everywhere. The gusts of wind are much more audible. It sounds not just violent outside, but uninhabitable. I mean, Dr. Glass wouldn't be able to stand up out there, would she? Especially not now. Uh, Vander sees that do- once she's visible, Dr. Glass is a 61-year-old doctor who walks with a cane. She, she's a, a bird-like stature. If you mean on a normal day, if, if there's not torrential wind gusts and an active storm... Walking around outside would be just like walking around anywhere else, except that mist of salt in the air. As long as you can breathe, then you could walk. No, I meant on a on a storming day. No, and as you can tell, not even a water stalker would be caught outside at this moment. If we get these canes together, charcoal, whatever, if it becomes possible that we can walk out there... With you, like how you are, motioning over to Dr. Glass, Esper's still, she's still in no condition to travel right now. I think she'll be fine. You hear, interrupting from Lord Felix Royce. I think this is our best chance to get out of here, and we're going to suck it up and travel along with this very kind gentleman to where we might find rebreathers. I think that's fair. Is that your uh, professional opinion, Felix? Yes, that is my professional opinion. And I take it you're the leader of this group of people? Yes. Ah, no. It's still on the construction who exactly is the leader. We're just all trying to work together, really. Trevor uh, has been instrumental in keeping us organized and calm. I look to him in moments of doubt. But there ain't no leaders. But if you're looking for the source of more water, I will be your man. I will interrupt here, priest. Uh, your gift, though incredibly useful in this situation, is not going to feed the thousands of nobles and above and below born. It's cute, but this water stalker is looking for a river of supply. One new river's found, it taps in and goes straight to whoever he's selling to. And judging by, well, 
It seems like he doesn't sell to nobles. Yes, well, thank you for contributing, Felix. But, uh, Mr. Vander, if you are in need of anything, Nihilus can create water uh, and light, and he heals. And uh, Dr. Singer and myself, well, as the title implies, we are medical doctors, and uh, we can help heal you or anyone you know. So there are several ways we'll be happy to repay you for your generosity and your expertise. I do think, Trevor, as difficult as it will be, we're perhaps in no shape to all stay here cooped up together in the current company for longer than we absolutely have to. As uh, you were pointing out to me the other day. Yes, and he sings and he dances, and that one over there opens the cans. Uh, I like, think we can skip to the part where we figure out how we're getting to this next destination. You said cans, charcoal. You got, you want it, we got it. Why don't you lead the way? Remind me what you do, Felix. I am the humble leader of our pack. Yes, he supervises. He's very good at talking. Well, as I said, I, I appreciate you let me crash here for the night. It, and I'll be more than happy to take a handful of you to where I saw this building. I can't guarantee there's anything in there. Uh, I wouldn't feel comfortable bringing all of you along. It seems like some of you are probably a little more uh, amenable to traversing uh, the the waste if we get some makeshift breathers put together. I, I would definitely want to come with you on that. If what you say is true and we don't know what's in that building, uh, protection is actually my profession. Uh, I would I would want to come with you with that. Make sure that where we're going is safe and clear. As would I. As will I. No, just joking. I think I'm one of the ones you meant should stay here. Actually, I think it's a great idea that Dr. Glass goes. In fact... Uh, that priest over there, Mr. Nihilus, that uh, man, Trevor, Dr. Glass, and the lady behind the door over there, our mystery guest who you haven't met, uh, all of them are quite capable at causing a ruckus. I think they would be great to join you along. And what I'll do is I'll look after everybody else while you make this journey. Make sure everybody stays safe. Make sure you come back. I'm not leaving you here with Hypatia, Felix. Out of your mind. As leader of this group, I have made a decision, Dr. Glass. And if you choose not to leave, we'll have to deal with it alone while they're on their trip. Nihilus kind of whispers to Dr. Glass, Father Patrick will also keep an eye out. He is my mentor, you know. I'm going to go work on making some of these makeshift rebreathers. I have a bit of excess energy just now, and I don't think I'll be getting to sleep right away. And tomorrow, well, that will be tomorrow, won't it? And she plops with her cane out of the room. All right. Well, you must be tired, Vanda. Thank you so much for having the conversation. We will speak again in the morning. Certainly. Though I don't think I'll be getting much sleep tonight. Oh, hell. Uh, I mean, I'm, I've got the first full belly I've had in a very long time, and I've been trying to slow my breathing the best I can. I'll tell you something. I'm pooped. Um, Vander, you are a godsend. I don't know from what god, but I'll take it. So... Thank you for paying us the courtesy. It was luck that brought me here. Maybe to be luck to get you out, so. Father Patrick leans over towards Nihilus. I think we know exactly who's helping us here. And a tense slumber befalls the bunker. Lord Felix Royce, for the first time, does not retire to his space. He stands outside, and though continually keeping in his meditative state something about him seems ever present if at all possible I would like to have a conversation with Abby 
uh, before the before the night ends. As you look over, and then again, seeing what Abby's working on, always a different little knickknack or project she's doing with her hands. I want to get your opinion. I think these people are crazy. Look at that guy. She points over silently. He's just standing there. And they've been trapped here without food. And now we're going to, what? It's already hard enough to survive out here. But it's also your decision. And I trust you. No, that's that's exactly what I wanted to hear from you. I mean, you see them. These folks, they're not water stalkers. They're not like us. They've been trapped in this bunker for, for what, weeks? They've got no rebreathers, no food, barely any water. The question that's been in my mind this whole time, and I'm hoping it's been in yours, is how exactly did they get here? I don't think the local butcher just took them on a cart and brought them out here. Nobody comes out here except for us. God, it could have been another water stalker. Exactly. So I don't know what kind of situation these people find themselves in, but it can't be a good one. Now, I'm willing to help them out because well, that, that's how I was trained. That's, why, that's how I want to train you, but I, the key is to always stay vigilant. So, yes, we're going to help them, but we've got to be careful about it. Keep our eyes and ears peeled for anything that can get us in trouble. And if it seems like these folks are more trouble than they're worth, we hightail it out of here as soon as we can. Okay? You know me. I can run faster than you. You can, and that's going to get you in trouble one day. She turns back and loops another one of these wooden circles over the wooden squares, trying to unravel this puzzle. Anyway, I'm going to do this for a little while longer. Uh, and then I'm going to, even though I sort of kind of trust the people uh, so far... I'm going to set up a little alarm barrier around uh, Abby, myself, and, and Bandit. And even with that done, I am not sleeping tonight. I'll take the point of exhaustion. Okay. Please take a point of exhaustion as you stay awake all night. And everybody else, I presume, is sleeping or is at least going to catch enough to avoid exhaustion? Mm. Oh, yeah. Do I get rid of mine if I sleep? Yes. Okay, good. Um, Vander. Staying awake all night, you gain a little bit of insight into this place. Lord Felix Royce is almost unmoving, though on occasion you see him open his eyes, stretch, crack his back, and then he just gets back into that same standing position looking up. You'd wonder how he himself gets any rest in this trance that he seems to be in. The rest of the camp is quiet. The meager, meek little Mr. Augie seems to turn in his sleep a lot and occasionally you hear little whimpers of crying coming from his corner. Um, you notice Ken doesn't sleep nearly as much as everybody else. Four or five hours and he's already back up and doing something productive. Um, and besides that, a full rest happens for everybody who gets it. And as we awake in the morning, Lord Felix Royce steps into the center of the room with one clap. Good morning, everybody. Today is the day we get out of here. I'm awake. And as Lord Felix Royce stands in the center of the room, he says, I've done it. I have a plan. Of course, it uses your plan, which is a very good plan, but I think mine's a little better. So I'm going to propose it. What did you propose, Felix? Well, not all of us can come with you. Of course, those who are civilians here, who don't run amok and burn down houses, I don't know, just throwing things out there, um, they should probably stay behind while you gather rebreathers and be safe here in the bunker. Also, they're not prepared to meet whatever it is is over there. Mm -hmm. I think we can all agree. He looks over towards Dr. Glass almost antagonistically. Does that make sense so far, Dr. Glass? She's still got, like, she's in the doorway of her room, kind of but turned back, facing inwards, because Hypatia's saying, 
uh, something to her and she turns back again and says, what's that, Felix? I was speaking to someone intelligent. Like I was saying, people should stay behind and obviously somebody needs to protect them. That'll be me. I will be happy to do that. And you, Vander, who has so generously offered to assist, can bring Mr. Von Stonen, Dr. Glass, Trevor, and I think Esper needs a walk. He says, loud enough for you to hear from your your room, Esper. So, you'll go, and I'll keep watch. That's the plan. Was anything different from your plan? I don't know. Just a big sigh. Just gets up from his bed and starts getting ready for the day. Nihilus doesn't even give Felix the time of day. He just looks towards uh, Father Patrick, kind of with this eye agreement of remember what we talked about. If anything goes wrong, I'll be ready. I'm not a fighter, but I'll be able to lend aid. But nothing will go wrong. Hypatia has assured me that our fearless leader, Lord Royce, would never be foolish enough to let our friends here come to harm because he is dependent upon us bringing things back to him. I, be- I am sure that that is the calculus behind your plan, Felix. Well, I, for one, am not a proponent of wanton destruction and meddling. Oh, my leg begs to differ. Abelard Cook's skull begs to differ, but we can agree to disagree. I know nothing of it. Anyway, uh, that's the plan. Oh, uh, right, right. There was one other part of that plan that just kept eluding me, uh, I will keep an eye on your partner, Vander, as well, because somebody else is going to need a rebreather if something goes down. They should use hers, and she can wait here with me until you return. Oh, that's that's not part of the deal, my friend. Deal? What deal? Uh, um, Abby goes where I go. I'm I'm sorry if you got confused on that. I I think you're the one who's confused, eh? Felix. I didn't say there was a deal. Don't be an idiot, Felix. Don't overplay your hand. Not now. I'm not going to be left behind here. There's no plan to leave you behind. The plan is to go get supplies and come back. Looking at uh, Felix, Trevor has already has the the predisposition to believe he's being like duplicitous, that he's being uh, just that he's lying through his teeth. Like, can I try and figure out what his, like, if I can connect the dots and see, like, perhaps uh, Felix just wants uh, Abigail alone for her rebreather? Um, you could roll an insight check, I think is appropriate here. Yeah, whether or not that's actually true, I want to know if Trevor would make that connection. It's a big old six. With a six, you observe Lord Felix Royce's body language and words carefully, and you note that he did offer for her rebreather to go with someone else. Uh, So it's though that rebreather is not his immediate goal. He does continue. Tell you what, if uh, if we want to change the plan, I'm open to changing the plan. Don't get me wrong, um, but it has to make sense for everybody. So if she's going with you, who's to say that you and her don't turn tail and run and abandon my allies when things get tough? Then we're all stuck. They don't know how to survive in the wastes, and you've gone. And I think, as he looks around, I think that's a valid concern. You make a very valid point. You don't know how to survive in this waste. She does. 
I do. She's my backup. She's my eyes. I need her out there with me if I'm going to keep your people safe. Please roll persuasion. This is an important roll. A 19. All right. I was thinking of keeping her for my own insurance, because then if you get lost, she can show the way, but I'll concede. You need every chance you can get to survive out there. I know what the salt wastes can be like. So we'll do this instead. You can make a makeshift rebreather for her. I'll keep hers. If what you say is there, is there, there should be no problems. And if not, you can return with my allies to get your rebreather back. All right, Mr. Royce. That is your name, right? That's my name. Right. Do you know where you are? I'm in the salt wastes. And I know that the salt wastes are north. So I at least know that no matter where I go south, I will find civilization. Okay. Have you traversed the salt wastes before? I've been guided. But no, not on my own. Which is why I'm trying to bargain for our safety. I understand. And your generosity, which has not gone unnoticed and is appreciated. I understand. And I'm I'm trying to meet you halfway here. I am willing, if Abby is willing, to part with a rebreather. But I want to make sure I am abundantly clear on this. It is a death sentence out there. You will not survive on your own if you choose to leave this place. Or we get back. Now, I'm not going to give you hers. She's keeping hers. I'll give you mine. All right? Yes. I'll take yours. And I'm not going anywhere. We need each other. And he looks around the room. Especially here. All right. I, uh... I don't even bother putting my rebreather on. I'll hand it to him. He takes it, and you notice there's this... this almost respect that he treats it with. He, in, in a, for a moment, looks a little taken aback. He puts it down and looks back at you. I trust you'll figure this one out, Vander, and thank you. And I trust you'll be here when we get back. Yes. I will. Good luck to all of you. All right. Now for these makeshift rebreathers. How many we got? How many do you think I would have been able to make? Probably five. I've got five. Well, that's that's plenty, right? For the moment. That should be enough, yeah. At this point, Nihilus has started to equip his breastplate armor, equip his shield, uh, even try to double cloth himself with everything that there is to spare, start to cover every inch of himself. I'm going to go see if I can wake up Esper. And I'm going to try to get some of those guards' boots to... I'm going to stuff them. Try to uh, basically... <laughs> Dr. Glass tries to outfit herself in something other than silk pajamas and bedroom slippers. And she can do her best here. She'll be outfitted with everything she needs, except all just a little bit big. And Trevor, you're going to check on Esper, you said? Yes. Just uh, kind of approaching the door. Uh, Slight little rapping on it. You can kind of hear from behind the door frame just a, a voice uh, not trying to be too loud just say uh hey it's Trevor uh are you uh you doing good 
I think there's a few seconds of pause, and then you hear a low, slow rolling sort of groan that just goes, uh, uh uh-huh. Well, that that sounded convincing. I'm almost impressed. You mind if I come in? Uh, You're met with a very similar sound. It doesn't seem to lean either way for an answer. All right. Maybe I'll just... uh, I am respectfully coming in. Uh, He uh, slowly creaks the door open and almost kind of like hand covering his eyes just walks in uh, before kind of like peering over. As you enter... The room is not in the same state it was when Dr. Glass last saw it. The vials of slow ether have piled up, not in neat triangles, but scattered behind the furnace. And there is charcoal that has been used to draw over the walls in the figure of a silhouette, a shadow, in across the room has been sprawled. Oh, damn. Uh, you really gave this place a personal touch. Uh, hey, uh, he's going to slowly start as he's like looking around the room. Uh, he goes back to Esper, kind of kneels down beside the bed. Hey, uh, looking over at the vials. Are you, uh... Are you here right now? If I may add some personal touches to this, uh, another thing in this small room that Trevor might notice might ping his memory slightly. That one night, somewhere in these three weeks, he may have woken up in his sleep to hear a thumping. Thump. Thump. It seemed to have gone on for some time, but it was soft. It wasn't... It wasn't terribly loud and eventually there was just the sound of what was like a couple heavy sandbags sliding down it might make sense why there is a dried browning spot and slight streak leaning down on the wall nearby the the charcoal picture but that's long dried and then where Esper is sprawled there is what looks like uh must have just looked like a torn piece of some sort of food supply sack draped over at least the top half of her face. And she slowly lifts a hand and she's like thumbs up? Um, gonna real quickly just gingerly try and peel that sack off (laughs) of their forehead. Esper's eyes are normally blue even if they are very deep blue. Maybe it's the darkness of the room, maybe it's not. Those eyes are absolutely filled and dilated. Hey, hey. You could... Um... Uh, Doc? Coming. Yes, what's, what's, what's wrong? Uh, I don't know what this is. I think you might, though. No. Oh, dear. And, uh, Wes, does this look just like ether or like a combination of ether and, uh, illness symptom? This looks like, and I think I'm going to also kind of pan, uh, pander over to Ari or to Esper. Like, tell me if this sounds right, but this looks like somebody who has, if not recently then generally taken larger doses of ether and the effects of it and the symptoms of having done so are more pronounced, the dilated pupils being among them. So she took larger doses of the stronger ether. That is going to be very apparent in the physical aspect of it and some of and definitely some of her her mannerisms but why did she draw a figure on the wall and when she's looking up around at the both of you 
she's like reaching feebly back for that cloth that Tra- Trevor took away. I cover my my eyes, then they can't they can't be in front of me. Can I? Can, could I have that that back? Oh dear! Did you have to prove me right just now? This is Trevor. This is not going to. I don't have a little thing in my bag she can smell and snap right out of this. Snap? What? I mean, I I've got time. I could be, be I could be better soon. We've got all the time down here. <laughs> Well, our good friend Felix is uh, has uh, given us the great honor of nominating us, you and me specifically, for an excursion out into the salt with a new friend who has shown up. What's, what's nominated? Trevor, can you help them up? Perhaps we can at least show Felix what the situation is. Here, here, I got you. Get ready, uh, Esper. I'm gonna pick you up. Oh, we're going on a trip. Uh, yeah, yeah, we're going on a trip. Just if you don't want to look, just keep your eyes closed. I'll get you out of here. We're we're leaving. God, I need a cigarette. <laughs> okay, okay. It's gonna pick them up. Basically keep the head uh, not quite it's not quite like a child but it's a little like a child uh, just head making sure that uh, her head is in uh, Trevor's shoulder away from the chest it's a tender area um, and just making sure that uh, that Esper doesn't have eye contact with the shadow on the wall just leads them out. Uh, I'm I'm sorry to butt in here. You sending that one out into the salt? I don't know, leader. Are we? It's part of the deal. She's going. <laughs> Trevor will notice she goes absolutely rigid in his arms the moment a foreign voice sounds out. She's like, "Oh, I don't know if." If a cloth is gonna help with with, with that one, it's all right. We won't be seeing them much longer. I agreed. Much will fit would be the wisest. Esper, how are you doing? Uh, hello, 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 Nihilus. As she looks up, she swivels her head, and you can see it was not a matter of the darkness. Her eyes are still just absolutely blown out. And she'll she'll give him a little, an oddly polite smile considering the rest of her. She'll clean up. If it's what I think it is, then just give it a couple hours. And Dr. Glass says into his mind this time, I understand me. I understand that you think it would it will be funny when I die out there. But you do want us to succeed in a basic sense, don't you, Felix? You want us to return with the supplies. Esper in this state is only going to to slow everything down. What what do you get out of this in the end? If you don't make it, then I'll find another way. But since you all our wonderful rabble-rousers who have gotten me trapped out here as well. I think it's about time we hold the ruler while somebody cleans up their mess. It's fine. I don't think I want Esper hanging out with Felix anyway. Well, we do it like this. If the effects indeed do wear off in a couple of hours, we do have the benefits of She's of lesser size. She would require less material in order to even venture out there. I know this is a tough question, but Trevor, could you perhaps, for the 
least the first few hours until the effects wear off, carry them. That's what I was about to suggest myself. I, I, I really like that idea. My legs have been, been hurting a lot. Here, do we have, um, you might not got any of them, uh, berries or, or, or water or something. Um, do you need, do you need anything to eat? I mean, we can use the rest of that, those rations, get something in your belly if you need something, Esper. Oh, don't worry about that. I feel, I feel light. I feel, I feel like airy. I don't really, I don't really feel hungry. Dr. Glass takes a good berry and pops it into her mouth, into Esper's mouth, and then goes back into the sick bay room to gather up the last of her things. Particularly to find the the last of her quick ether. Is there anything else anybody's doing before we venture outward? I mean, uh, Dr. Glass would say a few goodbyes. You could do so. And I, I would make damn sure to inspect the makeshift Rebreathers, just to see if they're up to par. You investigate these rebreathers. They consist of a can with a couple of holes born into it, charcoal, which serves as a filter. And as you put it to your mouth and breathe through it, you can feel the air flowing through the charcoal. Yeah, I mean, you get a bit or two of charcoal in your mouth occasionally when you do so but that's not going to kill anybody. And these will serve at least minimally to get you to the destination. You did pretty good on those, Dr. Glass. Thank you. Banda, um, please guide us through it. Um, whatever you require for us, uh, your eyes, your ears, something, let us help you help us, if you can, please. The best advice I can give you is to be ever vigilant and ever alert when you're outside if the salt gets too heavy if it seems like there's a storm of brewing or or any change in the weather let someone else know let me know right away you gotta find cover these rebreathers that you've made will, will serve in a pinch but if it gets too bad I don't know if they're gonna gonna, gonna handle it I got Bandit. He's very familiar with this area. He's going to be my my eyes and ears for the most part. Just, I ask that you just keep your eyes out. Don't wander too far away from the group. You got it. Right. Then, with that in mind, being suited up and packed up, you're able to approach the hatch, Vander, turn the metal ring to release it and step out into the salt wastes. The ground is visible. The storm has passed and what it left behind was surprisingly some lighter weather. Still, if you breathe the air, you'll die. But short of that, uh, you can see quite a distance and standing upon this hill that the bunker is situated, not too far, maybe a couple hours at most, in your sight is a old metal warehouse and making your way across this trek surprisingly easy as you approach the warehouse becomes more easy to see and out of one side of the walls there is this little hole maybe the size of a baseball and spindling out of it is this thin thread of a white substance. It almost looks like salt. It just continues. It, it spins and spins, and as this web kind of pours into the air, after some time it just disintegrates into salt dust and floats away. The building is largely corroded. Whenever this was built was not a time that bereamed metal existed, and 
Fortunately, it was built so well and so thick that even though the rust can dig an inch or two deep into this metal, there's still more keeping it sealed. There's no windows. or In fact, there are very few. The windows that there are are barred and heavy, and they're not of a glass material. They almost seem like a polymer of some kind. And the door being the only entrance in and out and the only reachable space, unless, of course, you were to climb the building, uh, is in the front. You see a metal gate that surrounds that has, at this point, disintegrated to the point where you could walk right by it. What do you do? Uh, well, my first question would be to ask if that uh, string, wispy string of salt, is anything I've ever seen before. No. It it almost looks like thread coming from a, a machine. Like you could use it to knit a sweater if it didn't just disintegrate into the air. But it continues to pour out of this building. And inside, if you investigate closer, please roll investigation. Sure. Hmm. That's a seven. Inside, there is a sound of machinery operating but that's all you can tell Abby, come here for a second yeah, I'm with you alright, we're gonna do a perimeter check I'm gonna take the left side and you take the right I'm gonna be cautious I'm gonna be quiet see anything, let me know alright can I get bandit this time? you can get bandit this time come on, boy and she runs around the side, uh, almost chasing like a kid in, playing in the streets with this dog as she runs in that direction. This girl's going to be the death of me. FYI, Wes, I would have brought the echo light, be holding it with my mage hand probably. So if I hear anything, I'd be better at hearing things. Okay. Uh, if that helps. Yeah. Uh, roll a perception check. With advantage because of the echo light. Seventeen. The sound that comes from the building, it sounds familiar to you. You can get more detail as you listen carefully, and you hear this rhythmic repeating pattern, this chunk. That just continues over and over again. And it reminds you of a loom. It's as if this salt that's coming out is being made like thread for a sweater. And I think uh, in the interim, when I introduced myself to Vendor, I would have explained the whole speaking into his mind thing. Uh, and uh, I guess, quickly, would that have horrified would he have said please don't do that again or would he have said okay weird but sounds useful like what would have been, what would his reaction have been his first would have definitely been of shock um, of hearing someone else's voice in his head that was not his own but I would imagine that uh, if we have that conversation then uh, he would have been okay with it uh, then she speaks into his mind now which gives him the ability and, and gives him the ability to speak into hers as well for an hour uh, and, and relays that to him. The loom sound. It's almost like a thread, etc. And uh, for my exploration of the perimeter, do I notice anything out of the ordinary? Please roll investigation with advantage because there are two of you walking on either side. By the way, uh, Abigail is flavored as an extension of you. So in combat, in whatever, she's going to be participating in your damages to a hit. It should be a fun thing to describe. Nice. Uh, even with advantage, that's still a seven. Wow. So, hmm. As you go around the building, Abigail, she skips off with Bandit. You go around the other side... And 
suddenly the torrential winds that had dissipated start to reemerge much faster than typical. Have you ever heard of a dwarf wave? These waves that come out of the ocean and just, they can slam you. Um, The storm picks up at the tip of a hat and it immediately becomes apparent that not even getting to the other side of the building, you have to get inside again. The storm is about to pick up to a torrential level again out of nowhere. Okay, Uh, so uh, realizing I can relay this information through my mind to Dr. Glass, I will just... No time to investigate. We gotta get everybody inside now. There's a storm coming. And she passes that. She waves. I think she's holding onto Nihilus with one hand and her cane with the other, and uh, the and the the echo light with Mage Hand. And she lets go of Nihilus to just wave everyone in and through the can on her face. Yep. You know, inside, inside. I will quickly whistle like a dog whistle uh, for Bandit, and Abby is very familiar with that sound, knows to come running. They already looped around the end of the building, being much faster than you, and she, you know, knows the whistle, and she just taps on your back as she runs by and says, Time to go! Nihilus tries to aid uh, Dr. Glass's side using uh, his trusty shield in order to try to block off the wind from her. Upon opening this door, there is a break of a seal. The the wind flows harshly into the building, and after everybody gets in, you're able to really, like, push it closed because it's so uh, heavy to push against this atmosphere on the outside. And finally getting in, you know, wisps of salt depositing on the ground in front of the door. It's dark in here. The windows are mostly crystallized with salt at this point, pretty thick. So whatever light casts through is almost like nighttime light at this point. Getting inside, you're inside of a factory. The the walls on the inside are much nicer than they look on the outside. Brick that must be encased in metal. And there are these large machines you see as wisps of salt seem to come from these feeders at the roof. They feed down and they flow through this like it's producing thread, but it's just creating this ephemeral, disintegrating salt-like thread. The whole place is like a ghost town. Dust litters the floor as well as wisps of salt. And stepping inside... You hear... Intruder detected. Intruder detected. Super darling, you good? Uh, tell him, sorry. We'll we'll be leaving. It's, it's, yeah. I don't want to disturb. To set you down. Oh, Oh, okay. You still got that sword I gave you? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And she's like pointing to her back, so you just kind of see an Esper hand pointing in front of you. Okay, just just stay low, stay out of sight. It's dark, you can do that. No problem staying low. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Glass becomes invisible. Uh, looking around quickly, do I see any any direction from where the sound is coming from? Looking around, you see there is a small iridescent red glow coming from the center of this room. There are these two large staircases on either side. The room is built a little bit like a factory-type maze. And as you take your first few steps just to see around the corner, you see what looks to be a ball. It's this large mechanical contraption of sorts. It has this little uh, line that goes from front to back that has that ambient red glow. And just as you peek around the corner, you see two hemispheres of this ball separate. And these mechanical feet start to pick it up from the ground. 
the belabored sound of this old rusty metal screeching as it comes to life. And that's where we'll end for next session. <laughs>